Yesterday, we got our first look at the version 4 editor for Elementor coming out in quarter two of 2025. And I kind of did a live reaction video. I want to look at some of the juicy bits that you might have blinked and missed it. So things where we saw a few screenshots and I want to focus a little bit on them and try and provide a bit of clarity from what I can tell from the screenshots. I don't have any special inside info. I am going to be making some assumptions, but I hope this clarifies a few things for you. Let's kick off with accessibility. And I was a little bit surprised to see this. I know there's been quite a bit of noise about how accessible can you make page builders. There's people that have done blogs and videos about it. Now, some of the widgets on here, I'm not sure how it's going to be presented, but this gives me the idea that there'll, there'll be like a tab or a pane somewhere where we can apply grayscale or increase the contrast or decrease the contrast of our pages. Now, there are pros and cons to doing this, because just because some people say you've got to have a grayscale version, others might not agree with it. But if you look at some of the widgets on here, they do make sense. The ones that kind of caught my eye are where we have text align. So to make things easier to read, you could align them to the left hand side, maybe. What about page structure? Does this mean that certain widgets will no longer be visible because to improve the page structure? Let me tell you about someone I worked with in 2002. They had a visual impairment and imagine monitor screens in 2002. They had like this magnifying disc and they were they were literally pressed to the monitor as they were trying to read what was on the screen. So could this make things easier for them? The same with hiding images. A lot of you are going to say, but if you hide the images, my website does not no longer look how it was intended to look. If you're trying to cater for people that have visual impairments or, you know, there might be something on the screen that causes a reaction, hiding images might be good for them. But to have that feature available might not be a bad thing. Pause animations, absolutely. Slideshows, carousels, you know, videos goes without saying. Sitemap so that you could quickly now get the structure of your website. So rather than someone going to a WordPress menu or down to the footer or trying to find where they need to go, they now might just see a site map option for, I don't know, contact me and they can click it and it will take them there. Reading mask. Now, my understanding of this is that if there are certain parts of your page that you want people to notice, imagine you've got a page, right? 20 sections, loads of text, but there are certain text on there that is key and pivotal to the point of the page or the website. Maybe it leads to a call to action. Maybe it tells you about what is the point of the website, why it's out there, what are the services you provide. I believe that this is what the reading mask will do. And it's going to be interesting to see how that all gets implemented. But, you know, I'm pretty excited that we are having some web accessibility boosts provided by Elementor. Because I know they get a lot of stick from this, but it's really good to see that they're taking this seriously. Now let's move on to classes and pseudo classes. We've been waiting for this for quite a while. It was first announced January 2023 that Elementor would be looking into this. And then it kind of went quiet. And for almost, well, two years, we kept wondering about, well, where are we? And I always suspected that if it was going to happen, it would be when we have version four. So, you know, there'll be like a class manager. We can apply classes. I'll explain that in a moment. We can do pseudo classes for hover active focus as well. And we can apply different styling. So for those of you that don't quite understand what's the big noise about classes, let me explain. Imagine you got a page and you got two H2 headings on there, right? And you want to say that the top H2 heading will be the Poppins uh, font family. There'll be three REM and it will have a 700 weighting, okay? And then you might have another H2 heading, but this time it's going to be a Montserrat font family and it's going to be one REM and it will have a 300 font weighting and it might be italic and it might be uppercase and stuff like that. You can apply class names. So you may call this one heading hyphen poppins uh, H2 and then you might have a heading uh, Montserrat H2 as well. And then when you drop a heading onto your page, you will go to wherever you're going to pop in the class, which over here is CSS classes, which makes total sense. And you will then type in heading hyphen um, Montserrat hyphen H2. I mean, you probably won't call it that. There's better ways to write it. So excuse me for my ignorance there. But you could do that and it would apply it. Now, that isn't too dissimilar from when you do a CSS framework, but sometimes some people don't like to do that. And if you could now just create a, um, a class name, like over here, we've got primary CTA on the screen. 
So you, you give it a name and then you go and pick your options. You're not manually writing all the CSS. You know, you're not manually writing border radius and then you're typing in the value and then you're sticking in a font clamp as well, clamp formula, sorry. You're doing it all on the screen over here. You've got a tab to do it and then it creates it. And then suddenly later on, you decide, oh, I want to change it. You just go back to that class, click it, and then you go and modify it. But so those of you that have been a little bit worried or, you know, twitchy about doing lots of CSS, because when you have a page builder, you just want to drag and drop. And if that's all you want to do, fantastic. That's all you have to do. But if you want to go the extra mile, you really want to make it unique or bespokeify it or do something funky. If you could start to apply that to a class, it opens up so many doors and it makes building websites even more efficient. We were also given some teasers about changes to the settings. Now we are told that this is going to be responsive. So normally you build out on a desktop, then you go to tablet view, then you go to mobile. Maybe when you're doing your typography, you stick a clamp formula in and it kind of, you know, transcends depending on whatever breakpoint screen sizes you have. But what we're being told is that this is going to be even more responsive. If you look at the far right, we get a teaser of the top right, bottom left. And I have a bit of an issue. Might not be an issue, but I'll give you my view. I think that this will be the layout we get for margin and paddings as well. Now, what is my issue with this? Logically, it is in the right order. Just stay with me on this. The way it works is clockwise, right? So you start top, right, then you go bottom and left. It works clockwise, okay? It doesn't work like, you know, the way you look at it. It goes top, right, bottom, left. And that's what they've got here. But because it's presented as a two by two grid, shouldn't the bottom and left be swapped over? Because when you're looking at a square or a rectangle or a circle or anything like that, you're gonna see top, right, left, bottom even though the logic works clockwise. So I think, or I feel, left and bottom should be swapped around. Because I get it, other people will get it, but some people might not totally get it. It has got a description, so quite frankly, get over it is what I need to say. But hey, let's now go on to the other screens. And by the way, I have taken these as screenshots from the video webinar they did with the Web Forward 2025. Go and watch that in full. So that's why some of these are not the clearest. But again, with responsiveness, we're told that we're going to be able to apply uh, colors responsively as well. That's pretty exciting. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think of a brilliant scenario when you would do that. Maybe you have your background color of your button change when you go from desktop to mobile, for instance. So is it now that you could have different colors? And that's what we're told. And I'm pretty keen to see how that's going to work. But what we have here, again, is just a slight change in the layout in how things are with regards to the styling tab. So it looks cleaner to me. I don't think we're going to lose anything we already have. I just think it's being done in a more easier and intuitive manner. However, there is one thing I noticed that a lot of people might not have. So we're getting all of these like potential changes that are coming on in quarter two 2025. But what about the top bar? Surprisingly, the top bar has not changed except one bit. So the top bar still doesn't have the pixel width. Uh, the history, you're still going to have to click the E to go to history. I did a video where I shared some snippets. Um, obviously, I'll have to make sure they still work when we eventually get the top bar where you can show the pixel width. But from what I can tell, or what we were shown, there is no change except the bit that I've circled. So normally you have desktop mobile, sorry, desktop tablet mobile icons at the top. When I look at this, I'm seeing like mini iPad or iPad, right? And then I've got two desktops. Now, I don't know if that was a mistake or if that is how it's actually going to look. I'm sure someone will stick in the comments. And obviously, we're seeing this now. It's not coming out till quarter two. I don't know if that's April, May, June. It might even slip to a bit of July for all we know, right at the end of quarter two. Um, it might even be quarter two financial year, which means we go April, May, June, July. It could be August or September. I mean, they said quarter two, which I'm assuming is calendar year, but hey, could be uh, the financial year. Who knows? We also got a teaser of background changes. So when you're applying like gradients or a background image, we now have icons. So when you're picking your cover, your contain, you know, your repeat, no repeat, all of that. And again, sorry if the image is not clear because it was small on the screen because it was amongst other stuff. So again, I've screenshotted, but you can see that they're now going down more of an icon base. I'm sure that when you hover over the icons like you can currently with Elemental uh, sidebar, you'll get a bit of a, a, a tooltip appear. But what was interesting was the gradient. At the moment, we use two gradients. 
you set your angles and your transparency and all of that. Over here, it looks like we can now do three. Can we do more than three colors? Maybe you just want to do two. So can we get rid of a color? So it's going to be interesting to see how that's applied. Of course, if you want to go a stage further, you could use CSS. So don't look at this and go, but I want 29 colors. Go add some CSS in and you can do that. Now I've left the atomic components till last. They started off with it when they were doing the editor before they moved on to everything else. I've left this to last because it's not that difficult to get your head around. Let me give you an analogy and then I'll talk about it really quickly because I don't want to overcomplicate it. Imagine you've got a pizza, right? You've got your dough or your bread. You'll have your sauce. Then you'll have your spicy beef, jalapenos, and your cheese on top. Mm, just the sound of that sounds good, right? That's your pizza. What if you don't want the dough? I mean, that sounds ridiculous, right? You just want the sauce, the jalapenos, the beef, and the cheese, right? You don't even want the dough. No dough or bread. I mean, that would be horrendous, but imagine that's what you're getting. When you get widgets like the image box that I'm showing you over there, that comes with the image, the title, the description, and a link that you can add in. Obviously, if you don't want to show the description, you could leave it blank. But what if there are some widgets? Pricing widget, call to action widget, testimonial widget, loads of widgets. In fact, before we had the loop grid, this is what the post was. You were given a like a block, a widget, right? And you had things laid out a certain way. You know, you had your title and all of that. If you wanted to rearrange it or get rid of things or not display it or add something else into it, you couldn't really do that because unless you were using CSS or you went and popped in a code snippet or something. So it, was all, it always felt like you were having to put in a lot of extra effort. Going back to the pizza, right? I don't want the bread. Atomic components basically means we are now looking at the components that made up that block. What made up that pizza? So if I don't want the bread, or I don't want the jalapenos, I won't add them in. What if at the moment I've got a link in there, but I want to add two links, I could drop in another link. Sorry, I could drop in. Let me explain that. The pizza, right? Yeah, I take, uh, I've got the beef already, but now I want extra beef, okay? I can drop the extra topping on. So if you take this image box, I know right now you're screaming at the screen and saying, you're just talking waffle, mate. You're not making sense. Take the image box. That is the structure of it and we have one call to action link. I now want another call to action link. Some of you would go and drop in a hyperlink into the description. But if I want two buttons in there, I think, and this is where I think they're going with it, I can take a button and drop it in. I can add the components I want to have the image box be what I want it to be. And I think this is a big move compared to how we just get, here's your, here's your widgets, right? And if you don't like it, well, sorry, I don't mean you don't like it. Here's your widgets. You can style it. But if you now want to rearrange or move items out or add items in, you're going to have to do a bit of funky coding or a bit of CSS. So they're going to be giving us the power to be able to do that. Now, I know some of you don't want that. You just want your traditional widget. I think they'll still be there. I mean, why would they not be there, right? They're still there, just like with the loop grid. If you don't want to use the loop grid, you still got the standard post and products widgets that you can drop in, right? They haven't removed any of that. You can build out your components to look how you want. Now, I've made quite a lot of assumptions about where I think they're going with version four based on the screenshots and what they told us. I could be completely wrong. It's going to be drip fed to us in quarter two, 2025 so that we have a chance to flex and grow with it. I don't think it's going to break your legacy websites. There'll be bits that you can use. When we had Flexbox containers, it was a big thing. And now it's kind of the standard. But that doesn't mean that if you've got a website that is six years old, I mean, I don't know why you'd have one six years old and not dated. But if you've got a website that isn't using Flex containers and it's still using section columns, you can still work on it. Nothing is broken. You don't want to use Loop Grid. You didn't use it. So I'm excited to see where this is going to go. Hey, I'm Imran Web Squadron. I hope you like, subscribe, share, and follow. I'll see you soon. <laughs>